This is Dr. Trevor Cottrell providing another video lecture in the Strength Education series. Today's lecture is on creatine supplementation. I did some research on creatine supplementation some years back, so I have a little bit of experience in this area, and I was asked to put together a little short summary on it, because even though it's been around for, geez, 19, uh, almost 30 years now, um, it's kind of fallen out of the limelight a little bit, so there's not that much information for young lifters out there um, like there used to be. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, every magazine on the shelf had articles about creatine, what it is, how it worked. Well, now it's a little bit more obscure, and usually a lot of the articles are combining it with all kinds of other compounds and making up all kinds of facts about it. So a lot of people in this generation of lifting just don't understand what it is, how it works, how it might benefit them, how to use it. So that's what this talks about. So creatine is a pretty simple molecule. I'm going to say creatine. Back in the day, they used to say it's like steroids. It's like taking steroids. No, it's nothing like steroids. It's more like it's, it's, it's an amino acid, really. It's close to a branch chain amino acid than it is to any steroid, for sure. And it uh, can be made in our body from amino acids, and it can be consumed in foods, especially red meats. Uh, we'll consume a couple grams of it a day. The amino acids that are directly involved in synthesis in the body are arginine and glycine, which doesn't mean a lot to anybody, but just know that it can be made inside the body. And uh, what's neat, it's a pretty simple molecule, no major charge to it. Um, but what's cool about it is that it can carry energy in the cells. So it sticks to this thing called inorganic phosphate, uh, which is used as kind of an energy provider during a variety of chemical reactions inside the body, i.e. when exercising muscles contract, they use energy, and one of the sources can come from this phosphate group that's stuck onto creatine. It's just a neat way to store this stuff inside of a muscle cell and allow it to do work. So here's a little diagram showing creatine. I know this is beyond what most of you care about, but just to show you how simplistic it is, uh, if you know anything about amino acids, you can kind of see the structures of these amine groups and carboxyl groups that are stuck together. Here's your creatine molecule. So what you're doing is taking this magic ATP. ATP is that major energy um, uh, workhorse inside of our muscles. ATP bonds are broken to allow for muscle contraction to occur. As a result, you get what's called ADP, and so you have to replenish this ATP and you can do that with creatine phosphate because here we'll take a phosphate group from this ATP and we'll stick it onto this creatine molecule to make creatine phosphate. And then when we're using energy inside the muscle, we drive this reaction back the other way. To, and then you get end up with free creatine. So you'll hear me talk about creatine or free creatine and then creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate is this energy storage form. Creatine itself can be uh, readily and spontaneously uh, changed in its structure to form creatinine. Creatinine is then readily excreted by the kidneys. Uh, it's, it's inactive. It doesn't really do anything else other than just gets peed out. Uh, so it's an interesting marker. If you ever do any urine tests, you'll see a creatinine measure that's being done. Anyway, so that's as simple as it is. Not too much scary about it. So what we're interested, though, is because it is an energy-storing compound inside muscle, uh, how does it work inside the muscle? How much do we have? And can we manipulate that? So we use these fancy terms when we're describing the amount of a substance inside of biological systems. Uh, so total creatine is normally around 120 millimoles per kilogram dry muscle, which is either 23 millimolar. All right, that should confuse you plenty. Just remember that number 120. I'll, say, I'll call it 120 units. So inside the muscle, generally on the average person, it's about 120 units, but it can vary quite a bit. Uh, they've done measures, people 60, 70 units, uh, people up to 160 units. What's interesting is those people that have tend to have lower numbers tend to be people who don't eat a lot of meats. So vegetarians tend to have lower numbers of creatine. And then people have higher numbers. And it's not always the big meters, just some people just have a really high number. We're not quite sure why of 160 units. And it doesn't seem like there's some kind of ceiling. You can only get so much creatine inside of a muscle before it starts turning it away. And that ceiling somewhere around 160 units. So you have a lot of this stuff in the muscle. And uh, about two-thirds of it is in the form of creatine phosphate, that high-energy compound. So out of 120, let's call it 80 units, will be creatine phosphate. 
Again, though, this can vary quite a bit. I mentioned diet, uh, age, male versus female. What really predicts what, why one individual will have higher than another is not clear, although diet is, seems to be a factor, but not the only factor. So now, can we change this amount? If I consume more creatine, can I increase the amount of this creatine inside of a muscle? And can I increase the amount of creatine phosphate inside of a muscle? And if I have more creatine phosphate inside of a muscle, maybe I can do more exercise, perhaps. So what, first of all, let's look at creatine phosphate during exercise. So if we exercise really, really hard, so get on a bike and sprint, or do sets of biceps or squats, you can deplete creatine pretty quickly. So again, fancy units, 10 units per second. So you can maybe get 10 seconds of really intense work out of your creatine phosphate stores inside a muscle. So it's known as that short-term energy providing source in uh, muscles during exercise. So if you've ever gone out and sprinted really hard, you should can sprint really hard for about 10 seconds and feel just fine doing that. All of a sudden around 15 seconds, you don't feel fine anymore. You start feeling yucky. Well, that means you've just depleted your creatine phosphate stores and you're going and using other energy sources. So that gives you an idea of when creatine is used. These very high intensity, short duration workouts. And uh, that's what we often see in the weight room, right? Sets of six or eight, um, you'll feel that first couple will be going good and then you'll start running out of gas. So we'll deplete creatine phosphate inside of our muscle tissues during those intense muscle contractions. Again though this rate of use will vary with um, where you sample the creatine from and the type of exercise modality. But the bottom line though is for the purpose of this lecture is if we increase the amount of creatine phosphate inside a cell can I therefore instead of running out at 10 seconds maybe I can go until 12 seconds before I run out therefore I can do more work. That is the question. So that's the question they had way back when. There was some really, a turn of the century of the uh, 20th century, there was some early research done on this. And um, uh, that kind of gave hints when it came to the 90s as to there might be something here. One of the pioneers of this guy, Harris uh, from the UK, he, he does a lot of this kind of work. He scouts around for supplements and tries them out and sees if there's any validity to them. But he got a hold of this back in the early 90s and started playing with it because he heard some rumors of some bodybuilders and athletes using it. And uh, what he wanted to know is, first of all, can you even consume this stuff in pure form? And if so, does it go into your bloodstream? And if so, does it go into your muscle? So that's always a question whenever you're dealing with supplement. Is it even used by the body or do you just pee it out or poop it out? And so what he said about is trying to figure out what is uh, an optimal dose that you could consume to increase the amount of creatine inside blood. So he tried a whole variety of different uh, doses and uh, basically did a bit of a dose response and measured changes of creatine inside the blood. And sure enough, he found that if you consume it, it does get into the blood. And he found that it seems like five grams to be a, a, a nice dose to maximize the amount of blood. If you consume more than five grams, you just don't absorb it into the blood very well anymore. So he came up with this five gram dosage, which is pretty easy because that's around a teaspoon of creatine, powdered creatine. Then once he figured that out, he varied the dosages daily and measured changes inside the muscle to figure out if he could increase the amount of creatine inside the muscle. And lo and behold, he found that by doing multiple 5-gram doses throughout the day for a period of 4 to 6 days, you can uh, pretty much max out the amount of creatine inside the muscle. And so you take an average, a person who's average of 120 units and get them up to about that 160 units. But he also found that some people were already at that 160 units and didn't respond to it and that's about 10 to 15 percent of the subjects that he worked with. And um, he found that by the fifth and sixth day, you're actually excreting the majority of what you're consuming. So it didn't seem like an ideal protocol, but that was a protocol that led to the kind of a maximization of the loading effect. So this became the standard protocol or the classic protocol. So four separate doses, five grams each dose, and so that's about 20 grams a day and you do that for six days and that's your loading protocol. But everybody recognized very early on that you're kind of wasting some of this stuff away so maybe you should you could vary that up a little bit. Uh, maybe if you're dealing with a very large person versus a very small person you may want to vary uh, the amount used and so a few different protocols were tested out after that by Greenhalf and others 
and they found that there's a relative uh, loading protocol somewhere between 0.25 and 0.5 grams per kilogram body weight. So if you're a 100 kilogram individual, so that's 220 pounds, you should probably consume somewhere around 30 grams a day instead of 20 grams a day. And so you imagine if you're a very petite individual who's only 50 uh, kil kilograms, so 100 pounds, you'd be consuming half that, right? So um, that way that saves wastage, but mind you, creatine isn't that expensive. So there's your two different protocols. There's still that loading phase over um, four to six days, which is pretty standard to maximize that peak in creatine, but they've tried a few different paradigms. They've tried three grams per day for 14 days, and uh, that seemed to work. It just takes longer, right? So the question is, at what rate do you want to load? How much do you want to pee out? How much do you want to spend? So a scoop a day is one way to do it. You just may not experience a, a neat loading effect, which we'll talk to it about it in a bit. Um, and uh, they found, well, if once you've consumed it, then you actually go down to baseline probably um, after about 30 days. So you get up to your max of 160 units, and then after about 30 days, you go back down to about 120 units. And um, that's pretty pretty much the standard discussion we have about this stuff. Then all of a sudden, people start realizing, well, there's something to this creatine, so in order to sell our product, we're gonna make our product sound even better, the new improved creatine formula. So they started mixing it with all kinds of stuff, and you got creatine citrates and creatine ethyl esters. Traditionally, creatine monohydrate's the main one you buy, it's the cheap stuff. Works just fine, folks. All these others, they're just bells and whistle gimmicks. Here's a little uh, secret for you. Most of the products you buy aren't very pure. Um, I did assays on creatine. I found something as low as 25% purity. But guess what? You still load. You know, either way, you're going to load. Uh, just you may not be excreting as much by the end of the week. Remember in the original study, you're peeing out most of it by the end, or peeing and pooping out most of it by the end of it. Uh, by the end of the loading protocol. So, if, so what if you're not getting a pure product? You're still probably going to load. It just may take five days instead of four or seven days instead of six, that kind of thing. Now, if you want to um, look at ways to maximize the amount of creatine inside a muscle, exercise seems to be one of the best ways to do it, although uh, consuming creatine with uh, sugar-containing products may enhance the uptake of that creatine inside the muscle. Again, though, is that physiologically beneficial? Is there a really difference, a big difference in performance that will come from a muscle that's 160 units versus 155 and people say well you you win sprints by two one hundredths of a second so every little bit help well again you got to be real about it if you look at the research on creatine the signals and noise isn't within that level of uh, resolution so don't get too anal about it is my advice to you you will load it's not so much about loading it's more about the training you'll see that in a minute so here's a, a little diagram that depicts the load. And this is Vandenberg. This is done quite a little while ago. So here's time and weeks on the x-axis, and this is the change in actual phosphocreatine and creatine phosphate. So that's the high-energy form inside of a muscle. So here's a one-week traditional loading protocol. You see this is baseline, <clears throat> and everything's reported as a change from baseline. So you see the loading group. Uh, they went up quite a bit after a week. The, this is the placebo group down here in the open uh, squares. And the loading group went up quite a bit. And then what they did after that one week period is when uh, they both started to train. So they underwent a standardized resistance training protocol. <clears throat> and you'll see just through that resistance training uh, combined with creatine intake, you still increase a little bit more, but it wasn't significant change from this point here. Um, this uh, was a maintenance protocol, mind you. This wasn't loading anymore. So this is 20 grams a day up here is three grams a day maintenance protocol. Interesting down here, placebo, no big changes. Then what happened after 10 weeks, they stopped training and they actually found a significant decrease. Um, well, it wasn't from this number, but from baseline, but there was a decrease in the amount of creatine inside the muscle. But it really, it was, again, small order of magnitude and there was quite a bit of variance. And then you plateaued off. Then at this point, they stopped consuming creatine through here. They're still doing that three grams of creatine a day. Then they stopped consuming creatine. And you see after about um, four weeks, you go back down basically to baseline. So that's your classic uh, acute and chronic loading problem. So short term, we call that acute. Chronic is over a period of weeks and how the body can respond to that um, loading and unloading of the creatine. Okay, so we know we can increase the amount of creatine inside muscle. Now the question is, 
uh, will it affect performance? And so if you have more creatine phosphate, if I hopped you on a bike and had you sprint as fast as you could, as long as you could, in theory, you should be able to do more, shouldn't you? Or if I was to make you do a set of bench press uh, before and then supplement you for a week and then do a set of bench press after, you should be able to do more reps. That's the thought because you have more creatine phosphate around. You can go for a few more seconds and there you go. You should have better performance. Well, they tried those studies pretty early on. And um, what was interesting is they actually didn't find that much improvement in a single bout high exertional performance in, in a lot of the studies, not all. They also tried it in uh, endurance athletes. And uh, there's a few studies that showed that during moderate sprints, like the 1500 meters, there may be some evidence of improvements. Um, aerobic performance, CO2 max, no, no changes in that. And uh, But that single bout stuff was kind of concerning. So here's uh, the class one by Snow. This is done fairly early on. Here's all kinds of measures. So basically they sprinted on a loaded bike as hard as they could. Here's your control group in the gray and your um, creatine supplementing group. And they showed that the loading effect did occur. But if you look pre-post, there's really, there was no difference. They didn't see any difference at all. And so people were right away going, oh, wait a minute. This, uh, this is a little concerning. It's not doing what we thought it should do. But then when they tried to do a similar protocol of sprinting on a bike, but now they didn't just do one rep. They did two, three, four, five reps they started to see significant differences. So as you increase the number of sets of a very high intensity, short duration work bout, you start to see the manifestation of the supplementation in improved performance. So creatine has been shown many times to improve high intensity, short duration, repeated bout exercise. So if you're gonna go out and do repeated sprints on a bike, that's a classic research model. But in a weight room, now you've got re repeated sets of squats or repeated sets of bench press. Uh, if you're a hockey athlete, it could be repeated uh, sets of sprints on the, on the ice, um, a rower, same kind of thing. So by doing these high intensity, short duration, repeated work bouts, they started seeing improvements over a period of time. Uh, over repeated sets. So that's the acute. So that's after if I measure today and measure one week from now. We call that the acute response. So we can improve this repeated high workload uh, activity. So you're not improving strength per se. You're not improving power per se. You're not, there's lots of things you aren't improving. You're just improving your ability to do repeated work. Bits. So now though, let's see what happens chronically. So chronically, if you consume creatine over a longer period of time, say weeks or months, so now what was interesting, they started looking at these studies and they started seeing, now I'm seeing changes in lean body mass. So they're getting more muscle. Now I'm seeing increases of force and power output. And we still see improvements in high intensity, short duration, repeated bout exercise. So isn't that interesting that uh, what the acute effects are different than the chronic effects? Well, what's going on here? Well, basically what's going on is that you're able to train harder. And this is shown, I like this, um, this little figure here. Uh, this is change in arm power output. So on an arm, uh, basically a biodex type, whatever, don't get into it. But they're doing set one, set two, set three, set four, set five. So five sets of arm curl exercise, and they're measuring power output during these maximal contractions. And so again, white is um, your placebo. Dark is your creatine. So this is after one week of creatine loading. You see that the creatine group, actually they got a little bit better right off the first set, but by that second, third, fourth, look at, now you're talking some improvements here. But what was interesting after six weeks, look at this, much better. So the, the not, placebo group still got better because that's a training effect. They're, they're doing resistance training. But look at the difference here in the supplementing group. So you can see, and then at 12 weeks, you see set one, set two, set three. With each set, the cha relative change in power output gets better. So again, this is that ability to increase the amount of work done during repeated work bouts. Essentially what this creatine loading is allowing you to do is kind of recover better between sets of exercise. It's not just improving one set. It's, it's allowing you to recover better, therefore making more creatine phosphate available during later sets in an exercise. So now all of a sudden, look at how much more workload you're able to do. If you're able to do more workload, what happens to a muscle? Well, it gets bigger. It gets stronger. It gets more powerful. So that's where you're getting the benefits. So through the combination of hard training of high intensity, short duration, repeated work bouts, 
in time, you're getting these improvements in lean body mass. And this is where people say, oh, it's better than steroids. Well, no, it's very, very different than steroids. It's, uh, it's indirectly affecting these muscle gains. Although some research suggests that there might be some direct effect on muscle protein synthesis, it's kind of sketchy. It's hard to really make conclusions from that. So there you go. That's kind of what you're seeing with creatine and why creatine may improve your performance. But remember, you know, research is research. Real life is real life. Some people don't respond, as I mentioned. Uh, there's lots of other variables that play into it. There's some studies that show that it had no effect. Uh, some studies that show that it's very, very small effect. Um, it may not be beneficial for work bouts that are longer than 30 seconds. It may not be beneficial for work bouts that have greater than six minutes recovery between them or less than one minute recovery between. So there's lots of little variables but like that. But generally for most weight training or repeated sprint events or football downs, there could be some benefit from that um, creatine supplementation taken over time. So now you hear, well, I used to hear a lot more about this, but you still hear about it now. Well, I'm worried about the side effects. This can't be good for you. Well, again, creatine, it's there. It's in the food we eat, and our bodies make it. It's a pretty simple molecule. They've done a, quite a bit of research on it. haven't found any real long-term negative side effects of it because it is it is just that. It's just a biological molecule, basically, that's already there. Uh, of course, uh, people who take it experience weight gain even acutely. Uh, most of my subjects gain about 1.2 kilograms of body weight. Um, people say it's water weight. Yeah, kind of. It could be other things too, but uh, creatine attracts water. Water sticks to it just like glucose does and just like amino acids do. So that's part of it. Uh, if you consume too much, you get gassy, bloated feeling, maybe some diarrhea, and that's normal. If you consume too much of any solute, it draws water into the stomach and that'll cause irritation and, and diarrhea. So you just got to cut back the dosage a little bit. So most of those things are pretty simple. You don't get crazy steroid like muscle mass, stuff like this freak here. Not to worry about it. But you'll see a lot of people say, oh, I heard it's bad for your kidneys. I hear it causes cramping. I've heard it. Uh, a guy told me, well, uh, I never get nosebleeds. And I started taking creatine. And two weeks after I took creatine, I got a nosebleed. Well, yeah, you know what? And, and a meteor might have hit in Russia too that week. So is it the creatine's fault? Anyway, so it's it's a lot of this stuff's blown out, out of proportion. People are trying to vilify it. Back in the 90s, there were some real strong efforts in athletic departments and universities um, in the U.S. to ban this stuff. They thought it was like steroids. They, they were clueless, as often these administrators are or ADs are at these institutions. Uh, wrestlers died at the University of Michigan. Oh, it was a creatine that caused it. No, it was actually the 15-pound weight cut over 48 hours dressed in garbage bags, exercised in a sauna and rhabdomyolysis that killed them. But yeah, they were taking creatine. But some of these uh, myths still hang out, hang around and uh, just it's important to know that the research has looked at effects of long-term effects on kidneys they've looked at long-term effects on children they've looked at long-term effects on liver they've looked at effects on cramping and you know what there don't seem to be any negative effects and what's interesting about creatine supplementation they're using it a lot now in a lot of disease states so because it's such a good energy carrying molecule, it can be useful in situations where blood flow may not be that good. So in situations like cancers or ALSs or um, uh, even heart issues if you're undergoing bypass and limiting reperfusion injuries. and So there's lots of medical uses for it that, uh, that they're starting to explore. So you can feel pretty comfortable that if you're consuming it in moderate doses or the recommended doses and um, using it in the way that people are recommended, you should be pretty good with it. If you start to get a bit of diarrhea, just cut back on the dosage. Don't worry, you'll load one way or the other. So the conclusion to be made here is creatine seems to be pretty good as a supplement out there. Out of all the supplements, one of the ones that have stand the test of time, it um, is best for people who are training high intensity, short duration, repeated work bouts, so multiple sets of a very intense activity. Usually you have a little bit longer duration, like one RMs, maybe not so much, but you know we're talking five, six, eight, ten reps, that kind of thing in the weight room. 
or those um, moderate distance sprints or cycle sprints. That seems to be when it's most beneficial with relatively shorter recovery. So that three to six minute recovery period seems to be where it manifests itself the best. Uh, recognize that there's lots of ways to load. Don't get sold into the hype, all the different supplements out there saying, oh, this is even better way to do it. And because um, most of that is just hype, just buy the cheap stuff, the basic stuff from, uh, I don't know what a trusted source is, but everybody says a trusted source. I don't know what they are because they all seem to have some filler in them. But don't worry, you'll load one way or the other. Don't get too hung up on these things. Be wary of some of these um, pre-workout drinks that uh, use a pixie dust technique. So they have 50 ingredients on the side and creatine's one of them. Well, there's not enough creatine in there to have a loading effect. So just eat creatine straight up is my recommendation. Uh, do it with exercise to enhance uptake. Maybe consume it with some uh, sugary meal to help its uptake. Yeah, either way, you'll load, no big deal. And then uh, don't worry about the side effects too much. Yeah, everybody's an individual. An individual may not respond well. If you find that you really don't respond well, then hey, don't take it. Train harder. There's other things you could do. But remember, with this, if someone wants to take creatine, it's not so much the supplement that makes them better. It's the supplement combined with very intense workload. So if the person is not able to train hard to begin with, they're not going to get a lot of benefit from creatine. So usually it's best to focus on good, hard quality training. And then once they're at a level where they can train at very, very vigorous um, intensity, then you can add that in. And usually I like to cycle it on and off, usually a month or two on and then a month or two off. And time the cycling of the creatine with those um, higher intensity, longer duration sets that you may have within your program. You know, if you're peaking for an Olympic weightlifting or a powerlifting contest, probably not necessary. You're only doing one RMs and two RMs. You don't need it. Plus, it's adding an unnecessary body weight, and you have to weigh in, and that could be a factor. So go off it, you know, four or six weeks out, and uh, don't worry about it. You'll be just fine. So I hope, I hope that was helpful for you. That uh, ends my little creatine conversation. I'm Dr. Trevor Cottrell, and I'll see you in the gym.